All right, let's say that we're going to uh, cast a movie, okay? Uh, we're going to cast a movie about 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 through 37. So Elijah is the main character in this movie, and we've cast Russell Crowe. Doesn't he look like Elijah? Sort of an Elijah figure. The second is a Shunammite woman, and we have Liv Tyler, who I found out this morning is Stephen Tyler's daughter. I did not know that. So I learned something in church today anyway. And the last is Jake Lloyd. He'll play the Shunammite's son, the promised son. Let me tell you the story. Visualize this, if you will, in your mind. There is an area of the world called Shunam. Many years before Christ in the desert lived a woman called the Shunammite woman, a well-to-do woman, affluent, married, but lacked the one thing that every woman in that world actually wanted and needed should their husband pass away. She needed a son. She did not have one. In the absence of social security and IRA accounts and stock portfolios, you needed a son to tend the farm in your older age. She longed for a son. Well, Elijah would frequent her area and do what a prophet does, proclaim the word of God. And she, being as hospitable as she was, noticed that he had no place to lay his head. So after consulting with her husband, they built an apartment for Elijah to stay in when he came to their house. It had in it a bed, a table, a lamp, and a chair. Fairly primitive, simple little efficiency apartment. And Elijah and his servant Gehazi would stay in that apartment when they came to her area. Well, laying in the bed one day, Elijah says to his servant Gehazi, what does this, what could we do for this woman and her hospitality? Can we show her favor with the commander of the army? No, she doesn't need that. Could we, and Gehazi says she has need of a son. He said, call the Shunammite. She comes in and he says, and he prophesies, this time next year you will be with child and you will give birth to a son. And the boy began to grow in wisdom and stature and was working in the fields one day with his father when uh, maybe heat stroke, I don't know what, he got some severe headaches. And he was taken to his mother and he lay in the mother's lap and this promised child, this proph prophesied child was laying in her lap and he died at noon. She had warned Elijah not to promise her something and not to disappoint her, but there she had in her, hand, in her hands, in her arms, a limp son. She took him and put him on the bed of the prophet and sent her servant ahead and went for Mount Carmel. She's looking for Russell Crowe and wants to know why he promised a son in God's name, provided a son, and the son had died. Well, they're on Mount Carmel. Elijah and Gehazi are at the school of the prophets, and they see this Shunammite woman running up the hill. Elijah says, wow, she's distressed, but I can't tell why. She falls at the feet of the prophet. She grabs his ankles. She bear hugs his ankles. She won't let go. Elijah sends Gehazi on ahead to take the staff of the prophet, place it on the dead boy's body, which by this time had been there for three days, and pray that he would come to life. The Shunammite woman will have no part of it. She says, I'll not leave till you go. You need to go. And when Elijah finally goes to the apartment. He gets on top of the boy, eyes to eyes, mouth to mouth, hands to hands, and the body grows warm. He begins to sneeze and he comes alive. In desperation, she threw her arms around the feet of the prophet and would not let go. Not let go for any other reason than for him to go directly to the corpse of her son. As the boy comes to life, before he passes her off back to the mother, she falls at his feet and grabs onto his ankles yet again in celebration and worship. I want to talk to you this morning and from John chapter 11 about falling at the feet of Jesus Christ. It is one of the most important lessons we can learn in a walk with Christ and one of the most difficult to internalize. In a fallen world of which we live, it is necessary to fall at the feet of Christ. It is essential. It is not only something we need to understand, it is something we need to experience. Let's look at John chapter 11 as we continue our series. Chapter 11, verse one through three. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, parentheses. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. At this point of our study in John, I want to point something out to you about chapter 11, chapter 12, and chapter 13. 
In chapter 11, she falls, Mary does, at the feet of Jesus in desperation. Chapter 11, 12, and 13 are about feet. Chapter 12, she worships Jesus at his feet. And in chapter 13, Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. There's a theme going on here that the evangelist John is trying to show us, and he's hand-selected these passages out of all the passages he could have written and could have chosen, and he puts these back to back to back. Feet, at the feet. At the feet in desperation, chapter 11. At the feet of Jesus in celebration, chapter 12. And at the feet, Jesus at the feet in humiliation, chapter 13. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glories so that the God's son may be glorified through it. Let me say that again. This sickness will not end in death. It is for God's glory. It is for God's glory. It is for God's glory that God's son may be glorified through it. There's a theme that we're picking up in John because we're studying a book when we're taking our time and we're being insightful as I promised you I would be. We're starting to see what John is trying to communicate to us by looking at the entire text. And that is this. In John chapter nine, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, speaking of the blind, land, but blind man, but this happened so that the works of God may be displayed in him. They were trying to attribute the blindness of the blind man in chapter nine to the sin of his parents. Jesus said, I'll have no part of that. This happens so that God may be glorified. Now, I ask you this question. What has taken place in your life for the sole purpose of God being glorified in it? I'll tell you, when you start to look at calamity and loss in that respect, you can no longer play the blame game. Others will not be blamed nor will you be blamed. Some things in a fallen world happen so that God would be glorified. And this is the point John's making in both chapter nine and chapter 11. Could, <clears throat> but some, some of them said, could this not be he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Even in chapter 11, they're remembering the blind man in chapter nine. Even then, they're asking the question, could he not have raised this man from the dead? Jesus lingered. He found out that Lazarus was sick. He didn't run over there like some sort of spiritual ambulatory service. He lingered. He delayed. He showed up only to find that the man was dead. Why? So that God would be glorified. The first thing I have to say to you this morning is, you may have got a raw deal, but ask this question. Was it because God wanted to be glorified? And our response to our calamities will determine whether or not God will be glorified or not. I want you to look at it this way. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are the work of your hands, Isaiah 64 and eight. He is the potter, we are the clay. What does this mean? Well, a potter places his hands on the wheel and shapes the wet clay. Take a little off here, add a little there, bring it up here, bring it down there, and let's fashion something that goes into a kiln that's tested that has a purpose to it. What keeps that wheel spinning? In conceptual terms, it's the challenges of life, the stresses of life, the anxiety of life, the worry of life, the calamity of life, the losses in life, the business problems in life. Those challenges exist to spin the wheel that God may form and shape you and I into the image of his son. The crap that we have to put up with in life exist so that in it we are tried and tested to the extent that we are molded and shaped into the image of God. Start praising God for your difficulties because it's in the difficulties that we grow. Do you want to know what the saddest part of a Christian life is right now? The greatest enemy to Christianity is apathy. So-so. It's okay, everything's all right. I don't really have a burden. Everything's going all right, I'm doing my own thing. It's cool. No, it's not cool. There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of moral decay. There's a lot of things to get desperate about. If your life isn't, and my life isn't, filled in some shape or form with a desperation, then we have a problem. 
We are not called to heaven on earth. We're called as priest and minister of the Lord to be desperate for certain things, for God to move in certain areas of our life, and we need those things to be challenged, to be discipled, to be trained, to be tested as men and women of God. Our challenges keep the wheel spinning. This is how God does math. First he adds, then he subtracts, then he divides, then he multiplies. He added to the believer's number in Acts. He subtracted through persecution. He divided up the people and he scattered them about and he multiplied the numbers in the church. Add, subtract, divide, and multiply. If your life is add, 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 and never subtract, 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 I doubt you're being divided. I doubt your faith's being tested. I doubt you're having to make decisions about where you stand on things. For the cushy life is one without a desperation, and we need desperation. We need desperation. I'm not saying everybody should be broke. Forget the material things of the world. That's not the point. Are you desperate for the lost people? Are you, des- are you growing desperate for this nation? Are you willing to hang on to the feet of Christ until he moves in the death of the morality of this nation? Christians today will see that wheel spin faster and faster and faster, and the vortex of this country will go faster around and further down, spinning down into moral decay until the church gets desperate to grab the feet of the prophet, to grab the feet of Christ, and not let go till he resurrects the death and the stench that we have in this country and in our personal lives. It's almost useless, it's almost useless to pray that it stops because the moral decline in this country is the very fuel that the church needs to rise up, wake up, quicken, pray, preach the gospel, raise up kids and put them in the waters of baptism. It seems to be a necessity. Why is the, this country in decline? So that God may be glorified so that God may be glorified. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Yikes. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. I guess some of you probably have had your relatives in your home for three days after their death for visitors to come and visit? Awake? Who's had that? Raise your hand. Nobody? We uh, nobody willing to admit they're old enough. Yeah, you used to have your relative in the living room there and people would come and visit. In India, I've been to villages where people have been sitting there for two or three days waiting for, giving time for villagers to come and show their respects. They had to walk a long way. This is, they didn't have a, you know, an SUV. So, <clears throat> four days, things get a little gamey, is, is the point here. And they're mourning, and they know how to mourn. They have professional mourners. How many of you, this is serious, you've lost a son or a daughter in combat, or you know someone who has, and they fly that black flag outside their house, or a POW, or an MIA? Yeah, that's what happens when someone dies. The whole village is alerted to the fact you're mourning, and they come, and they mourn with you, they wail with you, they sit with you. You even bring people in to wail and mourn in your front yard. That's the context. Martha goes out to meet Jesus. Mary stays at home. 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What kind of statement? That's serious. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Martha landed on the line. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Who says that? I am the, who says that? I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? See, what's the difference between Lazarus' resurrection and Jesus'? Everybody that was in the front yard of Mary and Martha's house that was wailing and crying, had a do-over the next time Lazarus had a funeral when he died again. 
Jesus raises from the dead. To my knowledge and my experience, he's still accessible and alive, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he ever lived to make intercession for us. So here is Jesus. If you don't know this Jesus, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He also says, I am the bread of life. If you're hungry for something more in your life, you're, what you're looking for is the person of Jesus Christ, something fulfilling, something that satisfies your hunger pains. If you're looking for life or satisfaction and gratification and you can't find it anywhere, it's because you're hungry for one thing and one thing only, Jesus the Christ. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. If you're fumbling apart in the darkness and you lack discernment of what your life's all about and you feel like you've got half vision for what the future looks like, if you spend most of your time looking at the darkness of the past for a lack of light in the future, if you don't know why you're here and where you're going and what your purpose is in life, you lack light. He says, I am the light of the world. If you, ha if you seem to have no way in, you feel like an outsider looking in, you don't, you're not understood, you can't seem to get in the game, you can't seem to make things happen in a group context. If you have a faith that's not understood by other people, you need a door. He says, I'm the door for the sheep. You need a way into the body of Christ. You need an access into understanding, an access into wisdom. You need to access clarity in your life. He says, I'm the door for the sheep but you feel like I couldn't do that on my own anyway. He says, I don't, I don't know that I could. I've proven I don't have the self-control. I've proven I don't have the discipline. I've proven I can't live this Christian life. Looking from the outside in, what's the point? I've disappointed myself time and time and time again. I need someone to speak into my life who will love me and care for me. He says, I am the good shepherd. I'll take you to where the grass is green. I'll tell you when to lie down and rest. I'll tell you when to get up. I'll restore your weary soul. I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the true vine. A lot of people look at the false vines in life, the gimmicks, the fads, the motivational speakers, the things on cable television, the psychics, the false religions. He says, I'm the true vine. I'm rooted and established. I'm both your root and I'm your fruit. He says, I collect your tears and I make wine out of them. I put them in a bottle and I make wine. I'm the gardener. I am the true vine. Your life will be fruitful in me. If you look back on your life and all you, all you can say is, I don't know what I really accomplished. I don't know that I did anything that's lasting beyond the moment, beyond the decade, beyond my life. Why can't we live lives that have a power and an influence beyond our death? Where's our spiritual legacy? He says, I'm the true vine. I can do that. Falling at the feet of Jesus, verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Falling at the feet of Jesus has a tone to it. The Shunammite woman had it. It is a, um, it is a sort of an anger. It's sort of a, a, a resiliency a stubbornness. Do you have a stubbornness in you that when you come to Christ and fall at his feet, do you have a stubbornness? I'm not leaving. I want this. You know what fathers do to children who deeply, deeply, deeply want something? They give it to them. You know, throwing up some kind of lame prayer. has got a passion level of a .001 accomplishing the prayer was more important than the content. Something's got to come from your visceral part of you. And this is, you know what, you know what I need to be more desperate for than anything else at the feet of Christ? I need to latch on to his shins, bear hug them, and not let go until I have an insatiable desire to reach lost people. We need to grab onto the legs of Jesus Christ and not let go in holy desperation, asking for holy desperation. What we need in the world today as believers is a devoutness to our faith equal to that of ISIS. When evil wants evil more than holiness wants holiness, there's a problem. Desperation. Things are not okay. We walk in truth. Acknowledge it as such. 
grab the feet of Jesus and say, I need a gut-wrenching sincerity and genuineness to my faith. I need to hurt because other people hurt. I need to care for people who don't care for themselves. I'm desperate for more of Christ in my life. There's a church. Revelation 1, 12 through 18 is something I encourage you to read. It's a synopsis is this statement. John the Evangelist, the very author of the book we're studying, when I saw him, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. The fullness, now listen to me now, the fullness of who Christ is. Not some Mickey Mouse concept we came up with, the fullness of the personhood of essence and nature of Jesus Christ. The fullness of who he is would cause a man to fall on the ground as though dead. That's power. Are we interacting with some sort of fairy tale here? It's, it's casual. It's sort of flippant. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. I prayed for you. Every once in a while, saints, there's a need for a need. The greatest need is for a need. Wives, when's the last time you grabbed the feet of Christ and wouldn't let go until you had a deeper love for your husband? Husbands? Are we operating at the potential and the current capacity of our emotional availability to one another in the flesh? Or are we asking Christ for a deep burden one for another? Something died. The American dream died. A Christian nation died. If you think this is a Christian nation, you have been in a coma for 12 years. <laughs> we fall in desperation when things really stink. And the body of Lazarus stinks. Psalm 42 and 1. As a deer pants for the water brooks, oh, my soul longeth after you. We've got to care about an absence of care. We can't go through the motions. Not in this culture, not at this time. Our enemies are more devout than we are. And it's scary. The fall of man falling at the feet of God. What are you desperate for? We fall in celebration and fragrance of worship. When things stink, we're desperate. When things are beautiful and fragrant, we celebrate. That's next chapter. And Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. It's funny. When you're desperate, you fall at his feet, and when things go great and prayers are answered and you're celebrating and there's new life, you fall at his feet. End of story. You and I need to fall at the feet of Jesus Christ, says John, says the word, the inerrant, inspired word of God, the unchangeable, living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword word of God says, fall at the feet of Christ. And don't let go. We fall inwardly in humiliation as Christ washes our feet. Our feet. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Now, what's Jesus' reaction to desperation? True desperation. When Jesus saw her weeping, as the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. I want, an, I want a relationship with Christ, no question. I want it to grow every day. I want it to grow for you every day. I want us to love him more and more and more and more and more. But that's not all. I want him to be deeply moved. I want him to look at me and say, Gary, I am deeply moved. I'm deeply moved because I see in you a spirit-led desperation. I'm deeply moved because I look at that church that I've given you this responsibility to teach, and I'm, I'm deeply moved because I see them deeply moved for the things that move me. I'm deeply moved because all I can see is the top of your head as you grab my shins in prayer. I'm deeply moved because I look at that congregation and they really do care. They really do care. They fall down and I'm gonna rise them up. 
I am deeply moved. Desperation at the feet of Christ moves the Father's heart, period. Casual, perfunctory, robotic, ritualistic prayers do not move the heart of God. And we sit around wondering where God doesn't answer prayer. It needs to come from the earnestness of the cavern of emptiness that we wish to fill with God that we ask for in desperation. Don't ask him to answer your prayers. Ask for a desperation first that when he hears it, he sees a deep faith and a longing and nowhere else to turn but him. Why? Because your situation stinks and he wants to be moved by it because something died. 34, where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Now, the next statement is our memory verse for today. John 11 and 35. I'd like everyone to memorize this by the end of the day. Jesus wept. This is, this is kind of, let's, let's think about this now. You and I are called to be Christ-like, yes? Jesus knew last week that he was gonna die. Jesus knew when he arrived, the tomb would smell. Jesus knew in advance to his coming from Jerusalem to Bethany that the people would be mourning. He had the better part of four or five days to emotionally prepare for the advent, and on top of all of that, he knows that he's gonna be raised from the dead, yet he still weeps. That's like weeping, knowing how the movie's gonna turn out. He weeps not because of Lazarus' death, he weeps because Mary's hurting. He weeps because Mary's desperate. He weeps because she's a worshiper. And in chapter 12, he allows her to continue to worship because he understands her heart. And when Judas brings up the money thing, it's all I could, all I could do not to hit him right in the face. Jesus wept and the Jews said, See how he loved him. I don't know. I don't know that they perceive that, Chris. It's not that Lazarus is dead. I think he's weeping because Mary is hurt. I want to say something to people who are depressed and discouraged and despondent and you're, and you're struggling emotionally in life. Please, 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 please do not perceive Jesus to be this happy guy all the time. For if he was, he, you could never relate to him. He, he wouldn't be personal for you. He'd be so outside the chart of your emotional realm, you couldn't connect with him. See him this way, Isaiah 52, 53, 2 and 3. There's no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus was not good looking. And for this I'm grateful, because neither am I, and I can relate. He was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Oh gosh, don't let your emotional downturns disconnect you from the very Lord who understands the depth of sadness and sorrow. Verse 37, but some of them said, could he not who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Everyone's looking at the corpse and Jesus is dealing with so much more right now connecting with people emotionally, understanding with empathy, being moved by their holy desperation, being moved by their faith that says, I not let go. I got to fall down and humble myself before you. That's what's moving his heart. 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across it. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Here's some words of advice when things stink in your life. Do what every person who stinks should do. Take a bath. What does that mean? Take a word bath. If you have difficulty trusting, get on Google and find all the scriptures have to do with trust and wash your mind with them. Rehearse them, pray them, recite them, memorize some of them. Douse yourself in trust. If you're impatient and it's really stinking up your relationships, get those verses out and wash over your mind by the washing of the water of the word of God. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be renewed by the, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renew your mind, get those weapons out. 
of the word and wash your mind with them and get off your pity pot. If you're worrying, you're in fear, you're in trepidation, these are things that you don't fall at the feet of Jesus, you fall at the feet of bankruptcy, you fall at the feet of depression, you fall at the feet of the stock market, you fall at the feet of recession, you fall at the feet of mortgage rates. No, at the feet of Jesus, you're desperate for what? His heart to be truly moved. You got to, you've got to take a word bath. Know this, any churches that don't bathe themselves in the word of God have spiritual body odor. You go into a church where they don't do much with the word of God, I'm telling you, it stinks because there's the smell of death there. What death? The very death in Lazarus' tomb. What do I mean by that? I mean the word is living and active, life. Living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. If you don't have the life of the word being preached, being taught, being recited, being prayed, being sung, there's a stench of death. And that does not move the heart of God. We have to take baths in the word. Feel the burden and be moved yourself. Somehow or another, we've been taught or conditioned or culturalized or whatever it is we've done to not feel bad. I'll tell you, in the life of a disciple, feeling bad is a necessity. It's an ingredient that God uses to trust, to depend, to relinquish, to surrender, to submit. I'm not saying we're called to feel bad all the time, but there's a purpose behind it. And the purpose is that God would be glorified, not your situation. Remember, if your situation is bigger than God, you're going to walk around with a little body odor for a while. God has to be bigger than your circumstances. You need to long for, I do too, ask for, and be thirsty for deep conviction. Here's a, here's a this is my, one of my preaching, this is the, my ministry verse, really. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 4. The gospel came to them not simply with words, but with power, with Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. If I can see that verse come alive in my preaching ministry, I feel like, well, I have been faithful. The gospel came to them not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. We are in need of deep conviction in this country. It's going to take courage. This would be a good time for us to not forget in holy desperation as we grab the feet of Christ to pray for our very congressman we commissioned off this platform who's going through a very difficult time, good, bad, or otherwise. Regardless of your political stance, you need to lift the brother up. Courage. We need to embrace desperation for the glory of God. Good desperation is a good thing for a disciple. Now, if we have financial desperation, we have relational desperation, we have emotional desperation, we have to ask ourselves this question. Why do those things exist? And in part, in part, it's probably because we're not actually doing what the word says. If you got superfluous debt running through the roof, you're, a, you're on a spending spree, you don't have a budget, you don't give to the kingdom of God, my guess is you're going to have some desperation financially. One way or another, you're going to realize and experience a desperation that you shouldn't even have financially. People who give, people who stay away from debt as much as possible, people who pay their bills, they budget, they, they, they have self-control, these people don't have financial desperation. Their needs are met. Relational issues. If we're repentant and forgiving and loving unconditional, we don't have those things. The kind of desperation I'm asking you to really be desperate for has nothing to do with those things. It has to do with knowing how to pray, knowing how to feel what's going on for this country, knowing how to reach the lost, knowing how to care for those who are going through difficult times. I would love a desperation in each person here. Originated and initiated by God for others that we see people as he sees them. We feel what they feel. We pray as he would have us pray for them, especially when things stink. You can take an entire 50 states and put them in that tomb right now. It's a lot of stench going on in this world. Are we desperate? So they took away the stone, then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you have always heard me. But I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they might believe that you sent me. Remember, the whole gospel is written so signs, performing of signs so people would believe. This is the last sign, chapter 11, apart from the resurrection. 
The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face, and Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes. Take off the grave clothes. There's a garment of praise that exists for a spirit of heaviness. I tell you, one of the things that you do more than anything else when you've lost someone really dear to you, you've lost a dream, you've you've divorced yourself from the future, whatever it is, you're going through a very difficult time, the number one weapon you have in desperation is praise. And that's why you fall at the feet of Christ and you don't let go. It's an act of worship. There's a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. I'm gonna open this altar here immediately, as a matter of fact. I wanna invite all the elders and their wives to come and pray over people. This altar call is nothing more than realizing that perhaps there is a lack of desperation that's being manifested in our lives, or you're desperate for someone else. And I'm just encouraging you to come up here like the Shunammite woman and grab hold of God's feet at this altar and not just let go for a few minutes and say, I want to be desperate. I want the heart of the Father to move because in me is a desperation to the Father as his child, and he will lavish his love upon me. If you're hurting today, you've just lost a loved one, you just lost a father, you just lost a mother, just come and grab his feet. Just just hang out and say, help me. Help me through your spirit to move your heart to meet my needs as I mourn. Would you, Lord, comfort me?